So thank you, thank you very much, uh, Phil, and thank you, Steve. Word in terms of TB and fight against TB, uh, and you have, and you have. No, I keep it there. Don't worry. Okay, I'll keep it there. Just. And you and you have uh, an audience that comes, you know, uh, so numerous to to hear the 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 struggle that we have in fighting tuberculosis. That's quite uh, reassuring. So uh, uh, you have to be really applauded for for the effort, which is not common. And I wish. I mean, apart, you know, we have had debates, we have had discussions over the last one year and a half about, well, we don't like this, we don't like that recommendation, but in reality, when you can have this kind of democratic debate, I wish we had it in every country in the world, because that is the way you actually progress, right? So now, um, what I want to do, if I can have the lights a bit lower, so that I, I can see. Um, what I want to do is uh, five things, uh, essentially. Uh, talk to you about the global burden in, in a summary uh, uh, way and the progress that, uh, that has been achieved so far. Some words have been said uh, about that. I will just put them in graphic and maps and so on. Uh, I will speak and present the new comprehensive strategy that the World Health Assembly uh, three weeks ago has uh, uh, approved. I will speak about the current status of coordination in, in the response in my view, and why, therefore, orchestration is absolutely necessary. And then I will go to some conclusions and some remarks on that. So I start always uh, any speech with this, uh, this particular uh, table, which summarizes the uh, burden of tuberculosis. And you see very clearly there that we are talking about 8.6 million cases every year and 1.3 million deaths. Those who can count uh, will, will count 3,500 deaths every day. 3,500 deaths every day because of tuberculosis. And uh, you see also that the burden in women and children that is often forgotten, especially by agencies that prioritize, uh, agency, I'm talking aid agencies or ministries that prioritize maternal and child death, they not necessarily realize that there are half a million women affected, uh, uh, half a million children affected, uh, nearly three million women affected, and all these deaths which are listed there. And by the way, talking about TB and HIV and comparing them, if you look at the estimates around HIV and the incidence uh, and the mortality rather of HIV, you will see that uh, the um, confidence interval de facto overlap. So in, in essence, tuberculosis and HIV compete for the number one killer in the world, whether we like it or not, and that's what it is. Uh, UNAIDS estimates 1.6 million deaths due to HIV, but then calculate within those the 300,000, 320,000 that are uh, dying because of TB. And so you see, once you put things together, that the two diseases are not that different. And then uh, in, uh, we have already heard about the HIV-associated tuberculosis story, and so over a million cases and 320,000 deaths uh, uh, in people living with HIV. And the last row expresses the burden that multidrug-resistant tuberculosis is now imposing uh, to those who fight for TB control. Nearly half a million new MDR-TB cases every year, and at least, we think, 170,000 deaths. So let me move quickly to the next one. Uh, there is some problem here. I'm pressing and it doesn't go. Yeah, that, fine, got it. <laughs> so this is the uh, estimated TB incidence rate. These are rates per capita. Uh, number one, TB has never been eliminated in any country of the world, you all know that. But there are some countries where the uh, level, the, the rate per capita is extremely high. You see Southern Africa, and that is South Africa, is Lesotho, Swaziland, Namibia, and so on. Botswana, etc. they have rates that approximate 1,000 per 100,000. We are talking about 1% of the South African population getting tuberculosis every year. So I don't know if you've ever heard about something like that, which is really major. And then you see that in the rest uh, of, uh, of the world, in Asia, in the former Soviet countries, in the Andean countries of Latin America, etc., TB is very, at a very high level still today. Oh, okay. Okay, closer. Is that okay, Pat? So, uh, and what you see there is a pie that illustrates the uh, distribution of cases in absolute numbers now. So Africa is about 27%, so a quarter, a bit more than a quarter of cases, but Asia with rates which are lower, but population that are much higher as about 60% of the cases. And then the rest is in the Middle East, in Europe, especially Eastern Europe, and uh, the Americas. 
Um, and these are the uh, data about the progress that we can measure uh, uh, thanks to a, a reporting system that has been going on for 17 years or so. You see on top right there our global report, the latest one launched in October. So in essence, incidents coming down slowly, but coming down, and this means the Millennium Development Goal is on track that only talked about making incidents decline. Mortality coming down, it has already been mentioned, 45% decline since 1990. As a result, 22 million lives estimated to have been saved since that time, an 87% documented QR rate, and in, in, uh, this is about 6 million people that are officially notified, so to speak, and 56 million patients that have been cured in that period of time. So these are big, big numbers. But there are, uh, of course, the but is there, and uh, this has been already said, and there are, there are a number of big challenges. I will illustrate some of them in the next three or four slides. Uh, these are the five priorities for action that we have, uh, uh, we have out, uh, highlighted in our latest report that incidentally correspond to what is in this current strategy, a global strategy, what will be in the, in the new strategy, and what I believe also the US government strategy includes pretty clearly. Number one, reaching the uh, missed cases. We have heard about the three million. Next slide will illustrate what I mean. Uh, accelerate responses to uh, TB HIV. We have heard about that. Consider MDRTB as a real crisis. MDRTB is the least uh, advanced of all uh, fields in tuberculosis, with only roughly 20% of the existing estimated cases that are, are being detected and put on treatment. Um, the issue of the financial gap and the issue of research and the delivery of new tools. Um, let's go through some of the slides very quickly. Reaching the missed cases. What, what do I mean for those who are not uh, uh, familiar with this type of figures? We uh, estimate 8.6 million cases coming down slowly. You see in green there, uh, 8.6 million cases in the last report in 2012. But we got actually reported officially and notified officially a total of 5.7 million cases. So either the estimates are completely wrong, which I doubt because these are coming from long exercise. They are very consistent over the years. So if the number is not 8.6, it could be 8.2 or 9.1, but that is what the range is. And roughly uh, uh, 3 million, therefore, not in the system. What are these ca cases not in the system? They could be cases never diagnosed. And we know of autopsy studies in people living with HIV as an example uh, uh, in rural Africa and so on. But there could also be, and this is an important issue that has to be tackled, I was just talking to some people outside, uh, that of the uh, hiding, if you like, of these cases within the non-state or, if you like, private sector. And if you look at the, ca the, the countries where the majority of these cases estimated to exist and not reported are. You see India is number one with 31%. So one third of the missing cases are in India. And we know that if you do surveys in that part of the world, you will de definitely find many more cases than what is being notified. They're simply hidden in the private sector, which means also not necessarily being diagnosed and treated properly. So it's a big issue. The, the second one is that of accelerating the response to TBHIV. We heard it this morning. I don't need to go back to many uh, issues about this, but uh, just keep in mind that this is an issue for this part of the world. Is 80 or 75 to 80 percent of the cases of TBHIV are in Africa, and the next after Africa is India. So they basically are, co are, are responsible for some 80 to 85 uh, uh, percent of the TBHIV cases, and their issues are common, common to TB programs and to HIV programs because not necessarily they do what they're supposed to do. Uh, while at the same time we have seen, I must say, progress in the last 10 years since the uh, announcement of a policy by WHO at the time with our HIV department, with the backing of UNAIDS and the TB program, uh, we have seen quite a lot of progress in uh, terms, for instance, of recruiting patients with TB to be tested for HIV, in uh, providing antiretrovirals and so on and so forth. But the progress will not depend only on national TB programs, it will depend Actually, I would say even more on HIV and ARV programs. Um, and the other big challenge is that of MDRTB, and you see completely the difference here. I go back to the previous one. So look at the continent here and look at this other one. And that's where the problem is, is particularly in Asia and in the former Soviet Union. Here are the percentages of TB cases that are MDRTB. And you see that in some parts of the world, you have up to 35, 35, one third of the cases that when they come to the system and they are diagnosed with TB are found with MDR-TB. That is Belarus or some oblast in Russia, as an example. 
And uh, this is just giving you the percentages, but if you look at absolute numbers, that's what you find. India, China, Russia, and South Africa, these four countries, have 65% of all MDR-TB cases in the world. So oftentimes we hear that there is no progress and this and the other, but if these three countries, particularly India, China, and Russia, don't move more quickly than they, they, they are moving now, then we will always have a problem and a gap. It's very simple. Now, when it comes to uh, the new strategy, so to face all of this, uh, we have now uh, gone to the World Health Assembly with a new strategy that was approved uh, exactly three weeks ago by the World Health Assembly uh, with the backing of the U.S. government, I must say, because U.S. government was part of the drafting of the strategy and a strong supporter of the strategy. Now, I'll give you, a, in the next three or four slides, a brief illustration of what it is. You should have somewhere this, uh, s uh, this uh, two-pager. I'm not so sure, uh, Phil, if that was ever printed because we are talking about printing this, uh, this particular two-pager. So it's, uh, it's around here. So you can see, oh, you have it, beautiful. So you can see the details, uh, which are, uh, uh, so to speak, summarized in that way. Number one, there is a vision here of a world free of TB with the zeros that are clearly inherited from the HIV AIDS community, but that is important to, to underline that we want to be as ambitious as the HIV AIDS community has been. So zero deaths, zero disease, zero suffering. And a goal of ending the epidemic, and when we say ending, we mean really getting it down to less than 10 cases per 100,000 in 2035. That is the level of the rich countries today, okay? And finally, uh, you have the three targets, the specific targets that have been approved by the World Health Assembly now, 95% reduction in deaths compared to 2015, 90% in incidence, and importantly, people don't put enough emphasis on that, no affected families facing catastrophic costs due to tuberculosis. So we are in the era of universal health coverage. We cannot have patients with TB becoming poor because they got TB, let alone MDR-TB. Um, and this will be a challenge, by the way, in, in, in how to measure, and it's something we were discussing, in fact, uh, last week even with our colleagues in USAID, how to measure that component. But we will need to measure it, and we will need to integrate it with, uh, with perhaps other measurement uh, capacity in WHO and other places where they actually measure uh, universal coverage in, in, in those terms. Now, the strategy is based on four uh, overarching principles and three pillars. The four overarching principles are straightforward government stewardship, we need that, obviously, uh, with accountability, strong coalition with civil society, protection and promotion of human rights, ethics, and equity, and adaptation of the strategy to the country uh, circumstances. The three pillars are on top there. The first one on the left is the one specific to TB. It includes all possible innovations that are available today. So there is no more hesitation about uh, chemoprophylaxis, for instance, that has been debated for ages in the TB community. We are saying we need to provide chemoprophylaxis to those at risk. And we know that now there are new regimens that actually seem to be less toxic than, you know, simple isoniazid for six months. The central one is crucial. It's for the first time, I would say, uh, not really the first time, but it's, it's not really the first time, but it's, it's, if you like, it's for the first time overemphasizing, if anything, the notion that without a good system around, without universal coverage, without policies, you cannot achieve global TB control. And finally, the third one is relying on the importance of research, and I go back to that in a second. These are the details, not to make you believe that there are just three pillars and four principles. These are the details. These are all very uh, well thought. For two years, there was a consultation here and building of consensus with, uh, with civil society, with NGOs, with partners, with governments, and so on, to reach this point of an, uh, uh, announcing a strategy that has this wording. First pillar, as I said, all innovation. Second pillar, you see there the policies that we consider essential. Uh, they go from universal coverage policy to social protection. People forget that during the six or more months of treatment, people cannot work and they have a loss uh, uh, in terms of income that is actually calculated to be about two-thirds responsible for the losses that patients and families incur into when they have tuberculosis. So it's not just the direct medical cost, it's the loss of income. So these are important issues that have to be addressed with social protection policies that, uh, that are really uh, solid. And finally, as I mentioned already, research. Uh, not only to have countries collaborate in new tool development, but also research on how then, operational if you like, on how then to optimize their use and adapt them to country settings. Now, this is the curve that under, uh, in, in a way is, is, uh, is explaining uh, uh, what we are trying to achieve. 
On top there is where we are, on top left, and on, t and on, on the bottom at the right is where we want to be in 2035. And this is the current global trend, less than 2%, roughly 2% per year uh, of decline in incidence. We need to accelerate, and we are giving uh, to the world, in a way, some 11 or so years by 2025 to reach an average 10% per year decline. By doing what? By using what is available today, current tools, including prophylaxis, as I mentioned already, in the hope that something else will become available between now and then, and ensuring the universal coverage and the social protection aspects of the game, which is exactly the recipe that worked so well in Europe and in uh, North America Half a century ago. So we don't see the reason why in 2025 the BRICS and other major uh, uh, countries that are developing their economy quickly would not be able to do this. They have to be put under pressure to do this. And second, uh, second part of the curve is where uh, the new tool becomes now, uh, the new tool issue becomes now crucial. Without a new vaccine or new prophylaxis, we won't be able to accelerate above 10%. That's the maximum ever achieved in humanity. And 17% is what we are uh, sort of aspiring there, is the uh, uh, decline that was seen in the Eskimo populations in both Alaska and the Northwestern Territories of Canada, when interventions were focused, uh, targeted, and extremely aggressive. It's possible to achieve in those little populations, if you want, but it's possible to achieve that type of level. So with a new vaccine and a new prophylaxis scheme, I think we should be able to reach that level, and that will take us to 2035. Now, let's talk about politics a bit more. So why is global coordination essential? Well, first of all, TB is a global disease and must be faced globally. And uh, uh, it means involving all countries, involving all agencies. It respects no border. So thinking like uh, something that you close the border and you prevent tuberculosis, that's not going to work. There are major cross-border challenges, and it's a health security threat in the world. And I would be very happy, I heard it this morning, that that becomes a very prominent part of the agenda of the Global Health Security Initiative of the US. Second, the, the World Health Organization now has a new strategy, is a, an ambitious one, ambitious target, and countries are urged now, because they signed it off, to uh, adopt it and adapt it. And the partners, the international partners, are the ones that are necessary in terms of supporting them in a variety of different ways, whether it is technical or financial. Third, MDRTB is a global threat, we said it already, and it's important to notice that there was another resolution at the World Health Assembly three weeks ago talking about antimicrobial resistance. Uh, I think Tom said it in the morning, unfortunately that seems to be focusing very much on bacterial infection, hospital acquired infection, which is obviously a big thing, but at the same time we cannot forget diseases like TB or malaria that have a similar type of problem, it's a health security issue. And finally, there are Fortunately, uh, there is fortunately a multitude of agencies, of donors, or NG of NGOs, of foundations that are involved in TB today, and it's absolutely imperative that they synergize. Um, what is the international orchestra? We are talking orchestration. So what's the international orchestra about TB? I think we are getting to a critical mass now, because for the first time in history, we have a bunch of agencies that can actually contribute. At the center, we always place the countries and the governments because that's where the action is and that's where the sustainability aspect has to be. Then we have the World Health Organization and some of our initiatives to provide the normative function and so on. Then you have the Stop TB Partnership that is doing advocacy and has the Global Drug Facility that is providing drugs to countries strongly and only, I would say, these days supported by USAID. Um, you have a bunch of donors there. Uh, the Global Fund, UNITAID, uh, USAID as a bilateral, as an example of bilaterals. Other bilaterals are weaker today than USAID is. Uh, PEPFAR, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that is mostly involved with research, but they also have a role in that. Uh, CDC as a technical agency. Other uh, uh, non-governmental technical agencies such as KNCV, uh, the International Union, the American Thoracic uh, Society, the European Respiratory Society, and finally NIH for what concerns the research. I just focused here mostly on American uh, uh, institutions and agencies, but there are a bunch of others. Uh, by far, the American institutions are the most prominent, as we all know. Um, fortunately, with this orchestra, we have uh, a long history here of leadership, global coordination, orchestration. We can always do better, and that's what we have to, in this new era, that's what we have to really have the ambition to do. Uh, the global TB community has been robust and coherent, I would say, supporting, always focusing on the country-driven responses. There have been policies, uh, consensus-based and 
particularly evidence-based, since the early 1990s. DOTS was the first example of this, then the Stop TB strategy, which is the current one, going from 2025 and in a way expiring next year, when the new global strategy will be taking over. There have been three glo global plans prepared by the Stop TB partnership with the help of WHO since 2000. We are now in the third global plan and there is work going on, I think Joanne will certainly mention that later, for the fourth global plan from 2015 on, of 16 to be precise. And uh, in countries, we have, all, we have, uh, uh, we have all uh, uh, had in TB the three ones in place. You know that this has been quite a lot uh, emphasized a few years ago in the HIV community. In TB has always been like this. Uh, uh, in a way, one agreed framework, a strategy, one national coordination authority, the national program, and an m and &E system. And the m and &E system is what has allowed the comparison of the data that we have produced, we have put together over the past uh, 17 years or so that allows us to understand what countries are doing and to estimate what they should be doing. Um, and finally, another important part of this uh, 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 coordination element is the fact that there has always been agreement in TB that cost effectiveness is essential and TB care, mind you, has always been judged and assessed independently as one of the most cost-effective health interventions available. And here is the proof. So this was the World Bank famous World Development Report 1993. And you see what the position of TB was there is one of the most cost-effective together with rehydration salt and vitamin A and so on uh, um, uh, interventions uh, that was available already in 1993, chemotherapy for TB, they called it at the time. And in 2006, this was reiterated in this new report that was sort of the follow-up of the World Bank report. And that graph comes from that report and it has been used by the eminent panel convened by Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General, to discuss the issue of the post-2015 agenda. You see TB is the number one there. So you gain basically 30 times from $1 investment in TB control, diagnosis and treatment. More than malaria, more than HIV, more than other intervention, including vaccines, which is quite extraordinary. People don't realize that often time. Um, just to go into more details, but I don't want to spend uh, uh, really a lot of time on this one, but every single tuberculosis intervention is either highly cost-effective, defined as you see at the bottom, or just cost-effective, including treatment of multidrug-resistant tuberculosis. That sounds very expensive and sometimes considered unfeasible. In reality, compared to uh, the GMP per capita and uh, the other criteria used for the definition of cost-effective, is cost-effective. And it costs, by the way, I didn't say it, but it costs only, if you look at uh, smear positive infectious tuberculosis, five to $50 right per year of life saved. That's the range, which is really nothing if you compare with other interventions. Um, and I just want to talk about financing because I think this is crucially important. Uh, let's focus on the top left, that's the BRICS countries. What you see over there is the funding required according to the global plan. That's the black uh, line. You see in light blue the domestic funding that is predicted to be disbursed during the next couple of years until 2015 on the basis of the GDP, GNP growth. And you see in green what else, this is just a sort of model, what else could be in a way uh, uh, put together by the BRICS countries. In, in short, although this is three or four, uh, no, more than that, it's probably five to six hundred million dollars the gap is fairly small relative to instead what you see in the LIC, the low income countries. Take the uh, bottom right slide. It shows a curve, it shows a big gap there because these are the poorest countries and it's quite unlikely that they will increase their uh, uh, expenditure on tuberculosis in the next two or three years. And that translates into that gap and that translates in something like I do it again, additional $2 billion per year necessary that have to be mobilized in a way or another if we want to really uh, 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 reach the level of the uh, global plan. Um, and I want to spend a couple of words on research to say that, number one, research is fundamental for the new global targets to be reached. I've already underlined that. Without new tools by 2025, I'm not saying tomorrow morning because that's unrealistic, but by 2025, we have a good 10 years to go, without a new vaccine, without uh, a new, uh, particularly new prophylaxis or short regimen that can be, uh, can be accelerating the response, we will not be able to achieve those ambitious targets. And, oh, there is something pro some problem here, I'm sorry. What happened? Just jumped. All right. The second point is that investments are needed 
uh, to feed the R&D pipeline and get, uh, and get the products uh, in a decade time. And this is uh, where we are. So there's been a doubling of resources put in tuberculosis research uh, between 25, uh, 2005 and 2010, but then there's been a flattening. And in fact, a slight decline according to the TAG uh, group that is doing this thing over the past one year. And finally, final point, I'm sorry again, is the needs are clear. In this world, we have clear needs for TB. Is a point of care, rapid and easy diagnostic, is a short regimen for treatment and prophylaxis in the vaccine. And these are the pipelines, we don't have time to go through it, I'm sure the next panel will be talking about it, the pipelines as they are today. Um, so, I'm coming to the conclusions, two slides. Number one, I think uh, that uh, what needs to be done next is a strategic uh, financial strategy that has to be uh, uh, really a global one. Uh, uh, these are principles that we uh, sort of uh, uh, summarized in a recent Lancet Global Health paper with our colleagues in, in USAID. Uh, we all agreed on this point. So number one, there is a need of continuing international financing, especially for the low-income countries. You have seen the huge gap they have. So either we watch and we accept, and we accept all these millions of deaths and so on, or we have to act. Number one. Number two, BRICS and middle-income countries must continue their uh, enhancement of the domestic investment that they have put, because they have put a lot of money into TB, but they need still to benefit from what I call smart international aid during this transition to self-sufficiency. We heard the example of South Africa, but I can tell you that in case of India, in the case of China, I'm not talking about Russia. They are busy with other things now, but, uh, uh, but uh, Brazil and so on, they all have their own problem. Probably Brazil is the only one that in a way or another is managing domestically. But if you look at the other countries, there is still a need. And the fact that they become non-eligible uh, to entities such as the Global Fund is a concern because they are not addressing the issue of MDRTB. So don't be surprised when you, know, you hear that 20% only are on treatment, there is no one doing anything, of course. They don't put their money and the international community is sort of dropping them. Uh, far larger investments, including from the BRICS, are needed to boost research and allow rapid technology uh, transfer. And uh, last point, OECD countries, Global Fund, UNITA, so the big donors need to continue coordinating efforts and adjust their aid flows uh, by doing essentially two things, strongly support the action in low and middle income countries that are in need and leverage, and I think this is crucially important, and that's where I think we need a real strategy here. Leverage uh, domestic resources in the BRICS to address particularly the equity issues. Because it's true that the BRICS are becoming richer and richer, but it's also true that there are a huge amount of people there that live under the level of poverty, and those are the ones with TB. Final slide, uh, conclusion two, collective leadership to end the global TB epidemic is necessary, and that, in my view, uh, depends on five or six points. Number one, the fact, and the, the, the fact that we need to respect that without country-owned agenda, uh, we will not ensure sustainability. So that is crucial, and we have to work in that direction. Number two, global strategy and planning now exist. We have a strategy, we have a global plan that is in the making, and so we must have common goals and continue. Third, we have to uh, continue as WHO the coordination of the global response when it comes to the normative function, the m and &E function, the coordination of technical assistance or the help in such a way that every country receives the technical assistance they need. Partners and donors, all of them, they need to synergize the efforts and that is the big challenge and that's probably also what the global plan has to in a way, uh, uh, the next global plan has to emphasize. Civil society, we heard it already this morning, is uh, uh, huge, uh, hugely uh, uh, important. I've been, uh, uh, I've been uh, uh, pushing for civil society and community engagement over the past decade. I don't think we are there yet to have the same type of mobilization we have seen in the HIV AIDS world. And finally, the US government is a leader, in fact is, you know, some people don't like this word, but it's the top leader in the world. We know that, we, we, whether it is USAID, Global Fund, PEPFAR, and so on. We have all the agencies here that are putting an enormity of resources, but we need more resources now because that's the time, really, to uh, commit to uh, elimination of tuberculosis in the next 20 years. So, thank you very much for listening. Okay, well, <laughs> thanks to uh, Dr. Rivik Leon for uh, providing a, a pr an international perspective on the on global TV. Um, now I'm going <clears> to <throat> I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Joanne Carter, who is uh, who actually probably will present a, both a domestic and uh, an international perspective. 
She's the executive director of Results, which is a, um, um, a grassroots advocacy organization. And, uh, had, and she worked for them for a long time and recently became the uh, deputy uh, chair of the uh, Stop TB uh, partnership. So, and Joanne will comment on this. Well, thanks. Thanks, Mario, for that great job. And thanks. Just to say first, um, my thanks as well to CSIS for um, the report and for bringing us all together. You know, as this issue is very close to my heart, my organization and our grassroots and myself have worked on this issue for a decade and a half to bring political attention to TB. Um, so this is really important at this moment that you're doing this. Um, and I would say, um, Mario, um, I don't, you did a really good job of going through that, so I'm gonna skip a bunch of stuff about the sort of why, because you laid it out. But I think if there was one slide I'd want, it is really that slide about the ambition of the strategy, because it's incredibly important, the fact that the WHA just endorsed that, and it really should be a driver for our global ambition and also a driver, you know, really for what we need to do next. Um, so I just wanna make a few comments on some of the broad recommendations and then talk about very briefly about a few of the key global elements around TB. And so in terms of the broad recommendations, um, I strongly endorse the report's call for increased U.S. government investment in TB and TB HIV efforts. And people that know me will not be surprised about this. But this is really truly not about just the idea that more, more money is a solution to every problem, because I think the report and Mario, what you laid out, make very clear in the underlying analysis that shows how far we are from the global TB financing targets, how disproportionately low TB funding is compared to disease burden and mortality, and also how unfortunately far we are from the TB funding authorization of $4 billion over five years and the TB targets in the 2008 Lantos Hyde reauthorization of PEPFAR. So, we're quite far from there. Again, Mario, you laid out really well why we need that money, you know, for scale up for poor countries, but not just for poor countries, for middle income countries to be ambitious with new technology and to bridge some of those needs, for um, effective long term technical assistance, I'll say more about that in a moment, um, to support important things like the TB drug facility for increased R&D. Um, and specifically, I would say we really need much greater political support on TB from the administration at the highest levels, as was pointed out in the report. Because as the report noted, the administration, the Obama administration, has actually proposed a 19% cut in USAID's TB funding for FY15. And Congress is going to consider this later this month. And I would just say it becomes, as people that understand this process know, it becomes very difficult, if not impossible, to significantly expand funding without administration support to increase that budget space. And, and again, as people who have been following this issue for years know, Congress has consistently been, for the last really decade and a half, the driver of increased funding for TB. And there were actually House and Senate letters this year to um, the key decision makers in Congress calling for $400 million for USAID for its TB efforts. So, and several members raised issue with um, uh, Administrator Shaw about the cuts. But in this particular situation of administration cuts, the unfortunate situation we have is that Congress ends up using its budget space just to restore funding and its political capital and to reverse those cuts, and we end up with a flat lining or worse. So really key finding. And I'd also just note that I think important lessons learned from the President's Malaria Initiative and PEPFAR is the critical importance of increased budget linked both to ambitious and specific targets and also the ability for more central reporting and more central control of budgets. And I'll come back to the Global Fund and PEPFAR in just a minute. And I would just say overall, the CSIS report makes a really powerful case for the need to increase political priority for TB by the administration and the global community, measured as increased resources and other political actions to implement key policies at country and global level. As you've pointed out, new tools brought to market, and we'll hear more about that later, and taken to scale faster, and most importantly, measurably increased impact for the patients. 
Um, and I strongly endorse and want to help promote this um, need for increased prioritization for TB. And I would a bit distinguish it from the issue of increased coordination, um, either for the USG and at the global level, which I actually think overall is, uh, is less of a gap, not that it can't always be done better, and also less of the rate limiting step. And I'd also say in broad recommendations that looking forward toward developing ambitious and concrete new targets for measuring progress, and also continuing to strengthen ways to measure program impact across the USG portfolio is very important. And I think, you know, an independent review done right by something like the IOM Institute of Medicine could really help inform the ways to further strengthen programs, but also could help build political support with the Congress. And then I briefly just want to touch on a couple of international efforts. So one, um, uh, well, Global Fund, TBHIV, Stop TB Partnership. So first, the Global Fund. Um, as noted, incredibly important for TB. More than 80% of the external financing for TB comes through the Global Fund. And U.S., so firstly, U.S. financial support for the Global Fund, but also U.S. political leadership to support the replenishment was incredibly important. Um, the U.S. pledge of up to $5 billion, the U.S. outreach to other donors, really key to the replenishment and will be key going forward. Um, but it's also, you know, there was discussion about the fact that TB is 18% of the Global Fund portfolio going forward. And I want to note that um, even in the new Global Fund's new funding model, it is still in very many ways a demand-driven model. So part of what will determine what happens with TB in the Global Fund is that 18% for the Global Fund, TB programs, but a lot of it is about the actual degree and amb of ambition and quality of proposals brought to the go global fund by countries. Mm, and countries get access to a baseline amount of funding, but they also have the potential, most of them do, to get additional competitive funding through something called an incentive pool. Mm, and if countries do a good job and have strong proposals, that which cannot be funded now mm, can actually end up in a, um, uh, what they would call a uh, register of unfunded quality demand that can be funded both by the global fund but and also by other donors. And the global, a lot of the elements of the global fund new model are also about how do we improve the quality of the investments that our countries are making with the money that they have. And I raise both those things because they really make the key point about why U.S. support for technical assistance is so incredibly important right now, as well as global fund support in the short term for technical assistance as countries develop these hopefully bold and ambitious TB proposals. Um, so we have to continue to push that, that the TB gets its fair share at the global fund, but we also have to make sure that we're doing the right things so that countries can be ambitious and do more and ask for more and get more. Um, I would also just say that um, one of the other mechanisms the Global Fund has, which is regional proposals, are really key for some of these cross-border issues like TB and mining, but also for this issue of how do we support civil society in the regions to support and push their own governments, particularly in middle-income countries, to actually do more on TB domestically. So I think those regional proposals have been, for HIV, um, civil society networks really important and could do the same for um, TB. I'd also say that um, one other point is just that the, there is really good news about coordination, I think, with technical partners and the Global Fund right now. There's, um, um, uh, for want of a better word, it's been called the TB Situation Room, which includes WHO, um, Stop TB, the Global Fund, the USG, and other partners working together to look at the technical support that's needed for countries now. Um, and that really has been working in a way better than, I've, um, than I think I've ever seen before and it's really mapping out the needs and the opportunities. So um, I'd like to touch really briefly on the issue of TBHIV um, that was strongly uh, noted in the report. Um, uh, particularly, I think there are opportunities with regards to um, scaling up for the Global Fund, for PEPFAR, as well as for some other donors as well. Um, my own organization, we've been doing some sort of to supplement in many ways the work that you did, we've also been doing some research on um, donor support for TBHIV. And what we saw in the Global Fund, our initial findings kind of linked to yours, is that Global Fund HIV programs historically have done far less for TBHIV than TB programs and far less than they need to. And that is less a reflection of the on the Global Fund 
than on um, programs at country level. And Julia Martin mentioned earlier the challenges of now um, countries being required to actually, in high burden uh, settings, of TBHIV to do joint proposals. And I think it's a challenge, but it's also really important because it's actually making countries do what we know they need to do working together. It's, there's gonna be some bumps there, but in fact, it's what needs to happen both in terms of working together to coordinate these programs, but also scale up funding. In terms of PEPFAR, I think what we found is what, what you all found and I think what the world knows, which is that PEPFAR has done better really than any other donor program in terms of um, coordination of TBHIV efforts, but it's still underfinanced. So um, ideally we want to see PEPFAR funding go up so we can do more of this, but even at current funding, being able to do uh, just 3% on TBHIV is really missing the opportunity of, um, of what we can take to scale and what um, PEPFAR has really shown is possible um, in a number of countries, but still not taken to scale um, across the board in um, the countries that PEPFAR is working in. Um, third, I want to say a little bit about the Stop TB Partnership. Um, I, am, I got to be vice chair of the partnership I was asked uh, last September. So um, just very quickly on the evolution of the partnership, I was on the board about five or six years ago and then just came back last September. And um, I note that because I've seen enormous um, strengthening and really growth in the partnership around governance, around an operational strategy. And um, I wanna lay that out because I feel like with that distance, I, can, I have that perspective, but also I'm not claiming credit for it, but simply seeing the kind of progress that has happened. Um, and the Stop TV partnership, for those of you that don't know it well, plays a really critical role in um, areas including really obvious stuff like engaging and supporting partners in advocacy at global and regional levels, helping mobilize TA, especially for some of the community-based activities they are gonna be key if we're gonna reach that unreached three million. It also has a key role through mechanisms like the Global TB Drug Facility and TB Reach. Um, GDF, the drug facility, as Mario mentioned, is a key mechanism for procuring the largest mechanism for procuring actually low-cost, high-quality first-line drugs, but now also second-line TB drugs and also um, some diagnostics. It's helped drive the price um, with U.S. support of second-line drugs down by over 25 percent, and the USG has been one of the biggest supporters of the GDF since its inception. The partnership also supports a really, another really interesting mechanism called TB Reach, which is small grants with um, uh, external kind of expert evaluation um, that are looking at ways to smartly scale up the kind of active case finding and outreach that's going to be needed to reach those three million that can then actually be applied to bigger programs like global fund grants. So kind of a let a thousand flowers bloom, evaluate what's working, and then take that to scale. Um, and I'd also say one of the other, um, uh, I think, important elements of the evolution of the Stop TB partnership, but also what it's doing right now, is what we need in TB, which is a set of champions. And we know we need a set of high-level political champions in TB. The chair of the board is um, one of our biggest champions in the world, the Minister of Health of South Africa, Minister Motsuledi. Um, he's been a champion in, in everything from bringing this issue to um, all of the Ministers of Health of Africa um, just at the World Health Assembly a few weeks before, leading on the issue of TB and mining in Southern Africa, and also taking a very key role in wanting to do even more in reaching out to all of the BRICS countries in their leadership around TB. So I think um, really important lesson about the work that he's doing and much more that can be done with him and other Ministers of Health and leaders on the board. Um, I think the last thing I would say about the partnership, it's in the midst of just beginning to develop, based on the new strategy, a new five-year strategic plan, so a new five-year global plan, with the goal that that is really an implementation plan for the strategy and a catalyst for change at country level. And I think most interestingly that the plan this time will try to show region by region the great potential that lies in combining new and traditional interventions, what it's going to cost and what would be possible using modeling to show how we could accelerate um, progress on TB. Um, and one, one uh, suggestion I was going to make and, um, for consideration is um, CSAS is called for an annual TB summit, and I wondered if um, you know, a next or a first one of those summits could even be linked around 
the rollout of the new global plan and linked also to the post-2015 um, stop TB strategy. So I'd like to think about that. And the very last thing I just want to say, um, Todd did note it, but I feel like we've kind of um, perhaps under um, invested and underestimated the role of the World Bank in these issues. So I heard that a little bit of discussion about how the bank works with ministries of finance, how the bank might help there. But I would also note um, the bank has you know, $52 billion in IDA funding. The bank has been absolutely critical in um, historically in the scale up of TB in India, China, Russia, um, and frankly is helping India right now meet some gaps that it found in its, you know, in its um, budget for its program. So I think um, thinking about both the sort of political leverage of the bank, but also the resources the bank has, we probably kind of underemphasize that as another um, key element to uh, tap into. And I'll stop there. Thank you.